see, you want to take a moment, welcome our campuses in. Can you give them a hand and just show them some love today? So glad they're with us. And uh, it is Father's Day. I do want to remind you, I know it's been said already, some of you might have missed it, but uh, we have a gift for every dad in the room out in the foyer. It's a brand new hat, because who doesn't need another hat? Come on, somebody, right? And, uh, and so you can, you can rep some Zion City, but also just the, that you're an awesome dad, and, and uh, we just, you stop by, pick that up. As a matter of fact, we're in a new series. If you have your Bibles, I want you to get, get them out and go with me to, to John chapter uh, chapter 4 is where we're going to actually spend our time, but while you're going to John chapter 4, I have a gift uh, for Father's Day from me to you, and it's called Dad Jokes. Come on, somebody, right? There's an entire genre of comedy that is attributed to your father. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, I, I thought I would just, I just want to make sure, dads, that you are well-equipped uh, for your children. I thought these were some of the funnier ones, and uh, if you don't laugh, I'll just stop. Okay. It says this, uh, <clears throat> first one is this, my father spilled invisible ink all over himself. He's at the hospital waiting to be seen. <laughs> my dad quit his job as an archaeologist. Now his career is in ruins. A little better. Okay, y'all are, I feel like you're patronizing me right now with like fake laughter, and so that's all right. But uh, my dad's computer caught a virus, uh, a virus, a cold. He must have left a window open. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't get that. Um, my, this is actually my favorite. Did you hear about the father who cut off his left leg? He's all right now. So, <laughs> John. Holy Spirit, come back to the room. Oh, John chapter 20 and uh, verse 31. You don't have to turn there. Uh, it is the foundation verse for this series we've been in called Miracles. Somebody say miracles. miracles. Say, it, say it like you mean it. Say miracles. miracles. And uh, we are contending for, believing for miracles, not just in this summer. But we just believe like this is a season of not only studying miracles, but believing. One of the things we, we know about the word is the word stirs our faith. And so that's why I, I really uh, try to focus on bringing you the Word of God rather than some, you know, cultural idea or opinion, but, uh, uh, and I'm not saying there's not opinions laced throughout my, my message, but I'm just telling you that it's foundation of the Word. But here's what I would say to you is that uh, I just want to encourage you at any altar, Wednesday night prayer, anytime we're gathering, we are contending for miracles, and so if you need a miracle, we've already heard of a, a few healings that hap, have happened already, but I just tell you, like, I just think it's the first fruits of many things to come, and so I want to encourage you to contend for those things, man. If you need a miracle in your life, um, just, just lean into it and just trust God and watch what God does, and I think it is, it is such an incredible season to be in, but we're in this series, the, the book of John is uh, what we are studying. And uh, John chapter 20 and verse 31 says this, but these are written, um, talking about the miracles that John recorded in, in the book of signs, they're written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The signs that were written, that were recorded for our benefit were not just for us to know that Jesus has miracle working power, but this miracle working power is connected to the fact that he is the Christ, the Messiah. And John says, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, it, it's interesting uh, in this room, in every campus and location, if you were to look around, uh, you would see that there are people from all different cultures all, all different generations. We are a, a, a multicultural, multi-generational church. Uh, I don't say that to, to, to be a sense of arrogance or bragging. I say it because we pray specifically that God would make us a church that reflects heaven. You understand, when you get to heaven, it ain't a bunch of white people. You hear what I'm saying? And uh, if I could cut to the chase. And, and, and the reality is this, I have always prayed that, that the ministries that we lead would be reflective of heaven. That heaven on earth is what Jesus tells us to pray, right? Thy kingdom come, thy word be, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so part of what we believe very strongly is that there is an incredible diversity that God has brought both generationally, uh, but there are more differences. And here's the thing I've, I've figured out is that no matter where I have traveled in the world, you know, cultures are different. 
Um, every culture that I go into has a, a nuance to it, a significance to it. There's different ways of viewing, different ways of understanding, different ways of seeing things. Um, there, there, are, there are differences in this room of, of, of socioeconomic levels, you know, financial levels, educational levels, status and station of life. We are literally just all over the place in that regard. I mean, it doesn't matter if you are living in the high-rise penthouse in parks, in, in, on Park Avenue in New York or living in the homeless shelters in tents. In, in LA. It doesn't matter if you have been born in the urban context or the, the city or you have been born and raised in the country. It doesn't really matter, even though we're all different, we have one sort of unique, significant similarity, and that is this. No matter where you go in the world, there is a struggle with sin. And you can see, I say that not just because to say, well, there, there's a struggle with sin. You can actually see the outcomes of sin in the world, the brokenness, the, the greed, the, 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 the hatred, the evil, the, the, what we see in the world today. You, you can go anywhere on the planet and, it, and you can be absolutely different. But one thing that is the same is we struggle with the fallenness of man. We struggle with sin. We struggle with the consequences of that sin. And, 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 and ultimately, the scripture tells us is death, spiritual and even practical physical death. I was driving in this morning and I was just contemplating, thinking about how many times people, um, they will ask questions, well, why did this happen? And why does that happen? And why do good people, you know, uh, have difficulties and challenges? And I can tell you that the word says this, that it rains on the just and the unjust. We live in a broken world. And you might do everything right before the Lord and still have a struggle. That should be a bit of an encouragement to some of you because there's this thought that, well, if something's going wrong, I must be doing something wrong. And can I tell you, you can be walking in faith, walking in obedience, and still think about the, the story of Job in the Bible. He was a righteous man before the Lord, a servant before the Lord, and yet he, he had difficulties come into his life. And I think about this and I thought how so much of it can be explained by the product of that, that fall, that, that sinful nature, that rebellion to God, that resistance of God in our lives. And, and this morning as I thought about it, I thought how, how John's account is simply given to us so that we can believe that Jesus, the Messiah, came to undo what the Bible says the first Adam brought into the world, death. He came to bring life. See, there is an answer for the brokenness of the world today. There is an answer for whatever it, the issue that you see is most important. There is an answer for it, and that answer is found in the Messiah, in Jesus. It is found, as John says, by believing in him and by believing we would have life instead of death. John chapter 4 is uh, where I want you to turn, verse 46. Now, we're talking about the miracles and the signs of Jesus recorded, but uh, today, I'm going to read the scripture to you and, and, and go on to the next, the next miracle, the next sign, but I really struggled as I was preparing because it is, it's only about maybe nine or ten verses, and, and not that I struggled with the length of the, the verses because I could probably take one verse and stretch it way too long. You hear what I'm saying? But the reality is, is I felt like this. I felt like we oftentimes read these miracles as though they are independent accounts, and what I want you to understand is there is, a, there is a theme and a flow that is developing through the book of John week after week as we come back to it, that you're going to come back to this idea that Jesus is the Christ, and if I believe on him, not only is there supernatural power available through his death and resurrection, but there is forgiveness, there is life through him. Thank you for the three or four of you. Amen. And so, and so I want you to see, so it's, it's sort of like this. As I came to this story, if you will, this narrative, it is sort of like the climax of the movie. You know, every movie has that point where it all sort of gets resolved. It all sort of gets fixed. It all sort of gets, there's this nice little, you know, every movie you go to, it sort of buttons up in the end. This is why I hate sequels. Come on, somebody. Like somebody was, somebody was telling me like, hey, have you seen... You know, have you seen Dune 2? Anybody seen Dune 2? You're like, oh, it's so great. And I was like, I hate going to movies knowing, because I'm a Christian. I hate going to movies. That's a joke. I hate going to movies and only to come out the end of it, and there's no resolve to it. I've got to wait for the next three years to understand what actually is going to happen. Come on, Mission Impossible, the latest one. It just irritates me. I'm just, I'm just griping right now. Can you just give me an ear? 
And so if I were to, to simply go to this culminating moment of John chapter 4, it would be as though I give you the, the closure without giving you the story. It would be like going to the movies just for the last 10 minutes of it, just to capture the, the last 10 minutes. You don't have any of the context. You don't have any of the, the tension that is held. You don't have any of the, the uniqueness of the story, the, the, the part that draws you in. It would, it would also it would be like going to church and showing up you know, 30 minutes late for just the altar call. Cricket, cricket, I love it. So we're like, oh yeah, I've heard about those kind of. Yeah, it always strikes me. I got to be honest with you, it just cracks me up, honestly, because I just, I just like, I don't even get it. There are times I'll see people that, you know, they're dropping their kids off, you know, thirty minutes into service, walking it, got to get some coffee, coming to forty-five minutes service, and they basically walk in for like the last ten or fifteen minutes of it, and I'm like, you have missed the whole lead-up point to this this significant moment. Now let me say this: that is the most significant moment, that moment in which we have a moment of response to God. The whole thing is built around this responding to God and leaving here different. So just, just let me help you. Don't ever walk out on an altar call. Even if you feel like it doesn't apply to you. Because what happens is, is we are becoming familiar with that which is the presence of God moving in other people. Could you imagine you bringing maybe a, a son or a daughter who is in crisis and struggling and away from God, and, and, and all of a sudden, you know, there comes this point of responding to the salvation message or responding to, for healing or restoration or a miracle, and, and somebody gets up and, you know, moves through the aisle and breaks that moment. Could you imagine? Imagine the opportunity of somebody missing out on that moment to hear and respond to God because somebody else distracted them. Just don't do it. Amen. Listen, I know you're like, but, but pastor, 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 McDonald's only serves breakfast till 1030. I get it. I get it. Honor the moment that you are in. Be present with the presence of God. Don't become familiar with this. Because what we become familiar with, we become contemptible of. You hear what I'm saying? We, we begin to diminish the power of God that's working. Someone's life is being, being there is all, all hell is fighting to keep them away from God. And, and I, that three more minutes, that five more minutes, listen, it's not going to make a bit of difference in your day, but it, could, it can make a massive difference in somebody else's eternity. Amen. Now back to John. It's as though we, we, we come, if I were just to tell you the end of the story, it's not giving you any of the tension that leads up to it. So today I'm going to do my best. We're going to begin at the end, but I want to back up and bring you into what I believe is the story that Jesus is really bringing. John is telling us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 4 and verse, 40, uh, verse 46, it says, So he came to Cana of Galilee, where, he'd been made, where he had made the water to wine. So Jesus... If you remember, was in Cana of Galilee's very first miracle of transforming water into wine, which wasn't just a, a statement of Jesus likes to party, but it was actually a messianic prophecy fulfillment of the wine that would flow when the Messiah showed up. It was also Jesus uh, choosing, instead of ritual and traditions of men, choosing to serve mankind, to value people over tradition. Amen. I know none of us have ever struggled with that. You, you get a bunch of sinners in the room, they just start messing everything up. Amen. They just, they just blow all the tradition out of the water, and we want to hold to our traditions. And Jesus said, hey, that tradition's not as important. The ceremonial washing thing is not as important as these people understanding who the Messiah is and meeting their need in this moment. Amen. You could say Amen. And so we see Jesus then go up into J Jerusalem. Why? Because he goes to the temple. I believe John, under the inspiration, wrote about the temple next because it's just, again, the continuation of the theme. Jesus disregarding the, the, the traditions of man in the temple instead to create create a way for people to come into the presence of God. People were selling and trading and actually ripping people off and doing those sorts of things. And, and, but but most, most egregious to Jesus was that they were, they were keeping people, the Gentiles specifically, out of the presence of God because their court was filled with all kinds of merchants and sale items and trading and things of that. And there. The, the fact that people were there to try to provide sacrifices for those who need them wasn't a bad thing, is that it had overtaken people's access to God. God, and that bothered Jesus so much that he cleared it out. 
And so we see him then begin to minister, and he comes back, the Bible says, to the region of Galilee, to Cana again, the place of his first miracle, his first sign. And in Capernaum, the Bible says, there was an official whose son was ill. Capernaum is probably 18 to 20 miles away. Um, obviously, there, there were no motorized vehicles. It would have been a, a, a day and a half walk, 18 to 20 miles, a day and a half walk probably for the average person to, to traverse from C- Capernaum to Cana. And there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him, come down and heal to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see the signs and wonders, you will not believe. It's just interesting that that you that Jesus used is plural, not singular. So it means he is not just talking to the, the father, he's talking to everybody who's in the room. Everybody who's in the sound of his voice. Have, have you ever talked to one of your kids, but you're actually talking to all of your kids? Right? Somebody needs to clean this thing. You're talking to all of them. Somebody should take the trash out. You should, man, somebody needs to trash. And we're actually speaking to all of them. This is what Jesus is saying. He said, you, you, you people, it's like all you want is signs, and you're not going to believe until you have a sign. And, and there's a bit of a seeming rebuke in this. And so he, he says this with this man in tow, and he says, the officials, um, <clears throat> he says, unless you see the sign, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down. Come to my house before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go. It's interesting. That's a fairly strong um, directive. It's it's not a soft, kind, well, bless your little heart. Why don't you just head on home? Everything's going to be okay. It's not what he says. Jesus literally looks at man and says, go home. Just go. Which I believe actually speaks to the act of obedience for this official, this father, um, to engage in to see this process of healing and miracles. He says, go, go, go home. Uh, your son will live. The man believed, the Bible says, the word that Jesus spoke and to him and he went on his way. As he was going down, though his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. Y'all following me? And he himself believed in all of his household. And this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Now, if you were to read that story by itself, it, 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 it seems like, wow, that's a great miracle. And you could draw all sort of principles out of it. You could draw, draw principles that we will about the power of, of Jesus' spoken word, that Jesus was not limited by distance. He didn't have to be in the room, that he could simply speak the word, that his word went ahead of the father and healed his son before the father ever got there. Uh, there's all kinds of principles that we could draw out. But what I want you to understand is this is the capstone of every conversation that Jesus has been ha- having leading up to this moment. And so I believe what we have to do is sort of back up and retrace the steps of Jesus to understand how Jesus is making this moment, this sign that confirms everything that he's been saying, every interaction he's been having. And so I've simply have entitled the message today, a Pharisee, a female, and a father. A Pharisee, a female, and a father. Because those are the three major interactions that Jesus had after the the return to Galilee from the cleansing of the temple. John chapter 3, we're going to back up, and I want to spend some time on this Pharisee. You ever heard of the Pharisees? Sometimes in in Scripture, uh, especially as it relates to Jesus, the Pharisees are interesting folks. Uh, Someone asked the question, where do these people come from? Where do the Pharisees come from? Pharisees would have been, as as close as I can sort of relate it to you, the Pharisees would have been the resisting um, holiness sort of fundamentalist movement of the day. Um, all of these sects, Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essenes, not the Essays, the Essenes, they're different. And the Essenes, um, the Zealots, all of these different religious sort of groups came out of the intertestamental period, which is the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a season where it says there was no revelation, there was no prophetic word. It's as though, almost as though God goes radio silence and all the world is waiting for the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. 
Now, in this period, what happens? Where do they come from? Well, what happens is the Roman government begins to interfere in the Jewish religion and begins to place um, high priests that aren't necessarily even Jewish or aren't even qualified for the job instead of, according to Jewish tradition, um, God choosing that person from the line of those who were a part of the Levites, the priests, and that sort of nature. So you have the Roman government coming in and interfering with religion. Imagine that, such a thing. And they come in and they start putting corrupt people in the high priest position because after all, if you can control a nation's religion, you can control the people. Amen. I'm not being political. This is just truth. And so all of a sudden what happens is these devout Jews start rejecting that system and say, no, 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 no. It's corrupt. It's defiled. And so they felt this need to create their own sort of sect and sort of approach, which is where the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, all those sort of came out. Now, each one of them was a little different. Pharisees, I say, were kind of the fundamentalists, the, the, in our terms, the right, right. I mean, they were, they were like, just resist. Everything was just, just, just to the detail fight. And so this is the Pharisee of the day. The Sadducees were a little different. Um, in that they sought, they had different beliefs, a little few different beliefs about resurrection and whatnot. But, but by and large, they sought to cooperate with the, the Roman government while still upholding, you know, the, the traditions of Judaism. And so they were like, we got to live here. Let's figure out a way to make this work. Essenes were people who just went off and lived in the desert, desert and just, just completely isolated. But, but here's what I want you to understand. Zealots were those who thought they needed to, to, to physically overthrow the government. They needed to fight the wars and kill the people. and that's, So all of this is going on when Jesus shows up. And in chapter 3, there's a man that you might be familiar with. His name is Nicodemus. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews, a man who came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, For no one, watch this, can do these signs that you do. So here's a man that, I would submit it to this, this is the way I felt like the Lord gave it to me. He's a man who's trying to to make all this work together. But but ultimately, when you look at Nicodemus, he was a, a, a religious leader of his day. He was a morally upright man. He was, he was given to the law. He was morally upright. Come on, you know people like that. They're just good people. They, just, they don't lie. They don't cheat. They don't steal. They don't you know, cuss or chew or go with girls who do. They don't do any of that stuff. They, they just have high standards. They are high moral people. Now listen to me, because this is a, this is a great deception in our culture today. Because we think that people think, well, all you got to do is be morally good. Just be a good person. Just be morally good. Just, just try to live your life in a way where you're kind or where you're loving or where you're, you're just a good person. And Nicodemus is that kind of person. Being a religious leader of his day, it would have been an honor to have had an audience with Nicodemus. He was, he was devout. He was morally upright. He was a leader. He was a, a, a bit of, a, of an influence in his culture and society of the day. But here we see this man coming to Jesus in the middle of the night. It should cause you to think, what's going on here? And so he says to Jesus, we know you're from God. Nobody can do the things that you're doing. Now, keep in mind, we don't have a record of, there's 35 different miracles recorded in the, in, in the Gospels. Even the Gospel says Jesus did, did even more than this than was recorded. And so there might be more than just the, and probably is more than just the, the water to wine. There probably have been healings. There probably have, and Nicodemus is this morally upright person who is struggling with Jesus. And so he comes to him and he says, we know you're good. Nobody can do what you do unless God is with them. And Jesus answered him. Now, I find this interesting because Jesus didn't say, oh, Nicodemus, you're just such a good guy. (laughs) You're right. You know, God's with me. No, no, no. He doesn't respond. Listen to how Jesus responds. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one, this is Jesus' first statement, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you understand that Jesus is addressing Nicodemus' moral uprightness, the very first statement out of his mouth? The real issue with Nicodemus was, Nicodemus, you think that by being a good person, that will get you into the kingdom of God, that will get you into heaven. 
And Jesus said, that's not how it works, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, unless you are born again, what does that mean? Unless you are born again, Nicodemus. Well, you might go, well, what does that mean? Well, Nicodemus had the same question. He's like, what does that mean? I mean, I'm an old man. He literally says, can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again physically? And Jesus begins to speak to Nicodemus and says this. No, 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 Nicodemus, you're thinking physically. I'm talking spiritually. He says, flesh reproduces flesh. The only thing that, you you can't go back to your mother's womb. It's too late. And every mother said, amen. I don't ever want you back. Right, okay. I love you, but we're not doing that, right? Uh, Not again. He said, no, 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 I'm talking about the spirit that reproduces a spirit. He says, you will only, only by being born again. Listen, in this culture, that that is so, I get so grieved sometimes. Because I listen to people just talk about like, oh, they're just a good, and I'm like, I understand they're a morally upright person. But Jesus is very, this is Jesus' words out of the gate. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, Nicodemus, listen, I know you're a good guy. I know you're educated. I know you're smart. I know you're influential. I know that you're a good person. I know you probably take care of the poor. I know you probably care for your family. I know you're a good guy, Nicodemus. Here's the problem. You need to be born again. You need to surrender your life to Jesus, the Messiah, and I'm standing right in front of you. And it begins this conversation, and i got to tell you, there's so much, I would encourage you to read it, because some of the most foundational verses of Christianity we find in the scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He's explaining what born again means, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to judge you or condemn condemn you or send you to he didn't need to come to do that he could have sat in heaven and condemned you to hell are y'all hearing me no he didn't have to do that he didn't have to come to the come to the earth to look around and say this place is a mess they're dealing with sin and the outcomes of sin no 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 he sent his son not to condemn you but that you might be saved through him and nicodemus now is confronted now most of history will tell you that Nicodemus became a follower of Jesus eventually. I'm going to tell you, sometimes it is harder for the morally upright to come and follow Jesus than the broken, wicked, vile sinner to see how good Jesus is in their brokenness. See, one of the greatest challenges we have in this country, in this world, is we think, well, I can be good enough. I can be good enough that God could accept me. I could be good enough. Man, I feel like I'm fighting all the hell right now. I I could be good enough that that God would accept me. But here's my question to you, sir. Then listen, here's all a simple answer that I'm asking for. Then how good is good enough? Please enlighten me. Help me understand your goodness, which the Bible says is as though it it is filthy rags before his righteousness. But I'm great. Let's go that way. Let's say being good enough is the way to go. Okay, then how good is good enough? I mean... Are you allowed to cheat on your taxes occasionally? Say a few cuss words here and there. I mean, is it how good? Well, you know, just the big ones, pastor. Just get the big ones. What do you, what do you mean the big ones? Like, just don't kill people? That's good enough? Don't steal? And the problem is, is this. If that were true, then, it, then here's my problem with God. For God to not tell us how good good enough is, is somewhat um, sadistic in nature. Because the reality is what you're telling. Well, I don't know how good is good enough. I don't know what you can get away with. Just kind of, kind of be a, a general good. Like, a good by whose standards? Who, who, who makes the call on good? Me? Because my good might be different than your good. Are y'all hearing me? So the problem becomes this. I get to heaven. I'm standing there. And they're like, well, Waylon, I'm so good to see you. And, uh, uh, we're so glad you're here. Now, why is it that you should be admitted into heaven? Well, I'm a good person. God goes, you know, that's right. You are a good person. Here's the problem I have, Waylon. Um, it takes a thousand good works and you only had 500. Or you had 999. And I'd be like, God, you never told me. Well, I know. You just should have known. No, the Bible tells us that if we are guilty of any sin, we have broken the whole law. So none of us are good enough. None of us are morally upright. And I'm going to prove it to you, even Nicodemus. Why do I say that? Because Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, 
And, and first of all, it could be because he's embarrassed amongst his peers to come to Christ. But I think there's something else working because Jesus, knowing the hearts of men, actually addresses Nicodemus. Remember, he came at night. And here's what Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, just a few verses later. He says, for everyone who does wicked uh, things hates the light and does not come to the light. Now, I understand that Jesus is ultimately talking about himself as the light of the world, but I think he is sort of giving uh, Nicodemus a statement about, here we are in the middle of the night. You're disrupting my good night's sleep, Nicodemus. I could be taking a nap, because you all know Jesus loved naps. Listen, it's a spiritual thing. Naps are a spiritual thing. Listen, you're just nicer after you've had a nap. It's the truth. Jesus said, you're keeping me up all night, and I'm gracious, and I'm willing to talk with you, Nicodemus. But here's the thing, it's only wicked people who operate in darkness. Read it. He goes on and says this. He says, lest his work should be exposed. Oh, if you came in the daytime, if, you, if I exposed the light of your wickedness, Nicodemus, you would see that you're not really that moral of a person. I love the way y'all are shouting. You put on the facade of morality for others, but there's stuff, Nicodemus, inside of you. There's some lust and there's some there's some anger and some bitterness, and there's some, there, there's, some, there's some struggles, Nicodemus, inside of you that I can see. Come on, somebody, don't look at me like you're so spiritual. He said, there's some stuff, Nicodemus, and he said, the reality is, is wicked people, they come under the cover of darkness, but those who, who he says, whoever, whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it might be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You see, the truth is you can be morally good and spiritually bankrupt. If I could talk to anybody in this room today, my, my, my heart is this. Don't, don't be morally good and spiritually bankrupt. I'm glad you're morally good. But sometimes I'm not encouraging you to be immoral. But here's the thing. Our morality is not that good. Our morality doesn't measure up. And so the reality is you need something more than your morality. The truth is we need something more. And what we've been given is Jesus, the Messiah, who says, truly, truly, if you, if, you, if, you, if you are born again, you'll see the kingdom of God. If you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And so the scripture tells us then that, that conversation sort of ends and it shifts pages. And now Jesus finds himself in chapter four engaging not only with a Pharisee, but with a female. John chapter four. I call her a female in this instance because, um, because it fits with the alliteration, but also because I think it's important that she is not a man and Jesus is talking to her. It's important. It, it says this in verse five is where we'll begin. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour, or about midday, about noon. A woman from Samaria. Now, I need to pause for a second, because Jews avoided Samaria at all costs. Um, it, it, it could be considered racial, but the reality is it had to do with the history of what, what Samaria had become and what it had done. You see, I, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but but early in the Old Testament, you'll, you'll see the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, are divided into 10 tribes and two tribes. The nation of Judah, which is a part of Israel, and, and Israel. And there's a point where, where the Assyrians come and they, uh, they invade Israel, the 10 tribes, that actually, because they are dispersed, those, those tribes become somewhat lost. And the remaining tribes of Judah, um, they remain that has to do with God preserving his, his prophetic word and his line of a Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. You see that. So I'm, I'm, I want you to understand something. Here's why I'm doing this. Because <clears throat> there's a principle in Scripture that says this, um, of Scripture that says this, that you will find the Old Testament and the New Testament revealed. You'll find in the New Testament, the Old, the Old Testament, you'll find it in the New Testament concealed. So what is hidden, sort of, so to speak, has been brought to light. So any time that I'm reading the scriptures of the New Testament and it has this connection to the Old Testament, I'm going to go back and study what is the implication of that 
for where Jesus, because Jesus, nothing is on accident. Why am I telling you this? Because some of you think the Bible, ah, it's just some book of books and blah, 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 blah. There is no, there is no man on the planet who's smart enough to do what I'm about to show you. There is no, there is no author, let alone 40 authors. There is no, there is, I'm just telling you, if you see this, what it does is the word brings faith. Okay? So this is what I'm trying to get to. So <clears throat> the Samaritans were of those 10 tribes and they intermarried with ungodly nations who moved in, right? And so it wasn't about marriage or interracial marriage. It was about the worship of idols and gods they brought with them. M- many of them, all of them, anti-Yahweh, anti-God of the Bible. And so they are now compromised in their religious practice. Are y'all following me? They're worshiping idols. They're Asherah poles and Molech, and we'll read it in a minute. But here's what we understand. So the Jews considered them to be compromised and even almost half-breed. So there's a bit of a heritage issue, a bit of a racial issue, but it certainly is founded on the issue of worship. You have introduced foreign gods into the nation of Israel. So they didn't hang out a lot. Are y'all following me? They actually avoided each other. There was a, there was a, a divide, so to speak, racially as it relates within this nation at this point. And here Jesus goes to Samaria, which is a little bit of a no-no. But he goes there. And not only does he go there, he goes and he sits at a well and a woman walks up to him and Jesus engages the women, which again is a no-no, right? Again, he is putting aside traditions and rituals to meet the needs of people. He sees the brokenness of mankind. He's not disregarding the law. There's a difference between rituals and traditions and the law of God. And so he's going, that stuff is made up by men. That, that doesn't bind me because I'm here to reach the lost. I'm here because the sick need a physician. Y'all following me? Okay, so let's read it in that context. He says, there's a woman um, at Jacob's well, he's sitting from Samaria who came to draw water. And Jesus says to her, give me a drink. Now, what's interesting, John has told you this is Jacob's well. We don't know a lot about Jacob's well except for it is, a, it is a connection to the story of Isaac and Rebekah. Do you remember that story? That Rebekah, remember when the servant of Abraham came um, to find a wife for, Jake, for, uh, for Isaac, rather, um, that it happened at a well. And what happened? The servant said, if, it's, if she's the right one, let her ask me for, let her be willing to serve me a drink. Now, here's the thing. Jesus transitions this whole story and says, I'm the right one, give me a drink. He has positioned himself as the answer to, to, the, to the, the God problem that this woman has. Are y'all following me? And so, and so it is an allusion to Jacob's well, which is the place where their marriage or their betrothal sort of began at that well. Their relationship began at the, are y'all following me? Now, this is going to make sense. You're like, okay, I don't know what that means, Pastor. Okay, let's think about this conversation with the Samaritan woman. It starts off with, hey, give me a drink. And she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> that seems a little awkward, but okay. And then the conversation switches from, from natural drinks to, to living water. And she's like, man, I'd like to have this water. I'd never have to come and, and draw water again. And then all of a sudden, Jesus makes this sharp left turn and, and starts talking about marriage. Hey, go get your husband. Does that seem odd to anybody? Right? Like we were talking about water and drinks and man, it's hot out here. Yeah, that's right. Go get your husband. Right? We were talking about spiritual things, which by the way, this, if, if Nicodemus was morally upright and religious, um, this woman, I would say would be a little more spiritual, not religious. She has a grasp on some spiritual things. She has some spiritual understanding and some disciplines perhaps in her life, but she kind of considered, come on, you've met people like, oh, I'm just, I'm not really like a Christian. I'm just spiritual. Like whatever that means. I don't know why they talk that way, but like, I'm just spiritual pastor. Just some spiritual. This is kind of how the Samaritan woman approached this. And I would say we are all spiritual, <laughs> but we're still, unless you're saved, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. So we are now here in this woman Lord help me. 
We're, we're here with this woman, and, and, and this conversation goes from water to living water to marriage to, to all of a sudden worship. This, this passage has been preached on worship. Those who worship God will worship in spirit and in truth. And so we pulled major ideas out of this, but we've never connected them. I'm about to connect them. Are you ready? He says, give me a drink. And she's like, that's, that's a little awkward. He literally says, um, <clears throat> his disciples had gone away. So the Samaritan woman said, how is it that you, a Jew, um, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying this to you, give me a drink, you'd, you would ask that he would have given you a drink of living water. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Um, there's this conversation that begins about the well. Now remember, I said to you, why did Jesus talk about marriage? Because the well was the beginning of the betrothal of Isaac and, and, and Rebekah. So marriages began at wells. Now, here's why it's important. He now begins to talk about marriage. So let's, let's look and see what Jesus says about marriage to this woman. Jesus said to her, verse uh, 16, go call her husband. Go tell your husband to come here. The woman answered him, uh, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. Right? Sounds like a fun day. Okay, you, you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. So what you've said is true. You've actually been somewhat truthful, though not completely truthful, because you've had five husbands. Now, let me clear up a little bit of a, of a confusion about this. Um, many people, when they think about this woman, they think she is, oh, she's a scandalous woman. The Bible doesn't say she has many, many partners. It said she's had many husbands. Nowhere in Scripture does it really teach that she is a scandalous woman. That's our assumption. And there's some reasons why we have those assumptions in the culture that we live in. But, but there's an assumption that, well, she just must be, because nobody, she comes in the middle of the day, and she's staying away from all the women. She might have just been introverted and didn't like people. She might have been so tired of all the talk. She obviously, what we do know about her is she has a problem with relationships. Fair enough. She's had five husbands. Now, here's what I need to say to you, though, about this, this woman. As a woman, it is highly unlikely that she would have been able to divorce her husband's so what it really means is that if she had five husbands, at the very least, um, that five men had divorced her. So maybe she's just hard to get along with. I don't know, but the Bible doesn't necessarily say that, oh, she was a scandalous woman of the night, a prostitute, but this is what we assume. But that's not necessarily what the Bible teaches us. Now, why do I think this is important? Well, because there's, a, there's about to be a prophetic moment in which Jesus is is standing in the position of a prophet, and he's not just talking about the woman at the well, he's talking about the en entire nation of Samaria in this moment. He says to her, you've had five husbands. As a matter of fact, and the husband, the guy you're with right now, he, you're, just, you're just messing around with him. You're just living together. You're just pretending like you are, are married and committed. You're not even really committed to each other. And again, this culturally of the day, it, it could have been an arranged situation for financial purposes. There's a lot that could be going on here. I just want you to not assume that she is scandalous, though she's got problems. She might be scandalous. She, she might be. It could have been that, that the life expectancy in those years, it could have been that half her husbands died. It's a true story. Like, life expectancy was in, in the much, much shorter life than we have today. And so all I'm saying to you is this. There is a, there is a reason, though, I believe that she stands in this moment and Jesus begins to prophesy. She, she said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Verse 19. Now, we have always taken that to say, well, he was a prophet because she knew she had five husbands. But I'm, I want to take you a little deeper in this because I believe what Jesus is doing here is not just talking to a woman because he's come as the Messiah. He's talking to a nation, Samaria. If you've got a Bible, uh, go with me to 2 Kings chapter 17. I want to read this to you, verse, verse 29. But every nation still made gods of its own and put them in shrines. It's on the, on the screens if you need it. Every nation put shrines uh, in high places that the Samaritans had made. Watch this. Old Testament, New Testament revealed. Every nation in the cities in which they lived, the men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth. The men of Kuth made Nergal. The men of Hamath made Ashima. Three. 
The Avites made Nibs, Nibhaz and Tartek. If you ever want a biblical name for your kid, Tartek would be awesome. Okay. No, probably not because it's an idol and a demon. Okay. Right? Um, and so, and again, that sounds like two gods. It's not really. It's an animal god worship um, in, a, in the same system of worship. He, he, so it's, it's actually the, the, the fourth and he says, and then the, the, Servites, the Seprovites burned their children in the fire of Adramelech and Anamelech, which is Molech, the god of, of the sun and the solar system, that they would burn their children. They would kill their small children as an offering, uh, the gods of the, the, the Seprovim. Now, how many is that? Five. Jesus is speaking to a nation. He, he said, you've been married to to five false gods as a nation. You've got five husbands. He said, and the man you're with now is, is not really your husband. You're, you're playing commitment, but you're not really committed. What, what does that mean? Verse 33, so they feared the Lord, but they served their own gods. Did you get that? They feared God, but they weren't really committed to him. It's the sixth. Five, five gods that Samaria has has the Bible uses the terminology, forgive me, they have whored after infidelity. They have pursued instead of their God. It's interesting that God's speaking to a woman who has five husbands and prophetically begins to speak not just to her, but to an entire nation. Just stick with me. You're like, that's all great, pastor. What does it mean? What he is saying is this. He says, you know what? You you have five husbands. Samaria's had five gods and every one of them have failed you. And you have continued to look for a God that will fulfill you. And the God that you have now, the God Yahweh, the God of the Bible, you're not really committed to him. But the truth is this. You fear him, but you still have your own God's on the side. If I'd ever heard a statement that describes the American church today, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but I've got my own God's on the side. I've got other things that I serve. Oh, you can have it all, the secretism of the day. Oh, you could, you know what, you could serve God and, and, and bring in new age. You could serve God and serve. It doesn't really matter. He says, you fear God, but you're not committed to him. That's the sixth He says, he's not really your husband. That's the picture that God gave Israel, that I would be your husband, that I would be Jesus in the first miracle. What does he become? He becomes, puts himself in the position of the bridegroom and says, I'll be the bridegroom. You can be the bride. I'll provide the new wine. I'll provide the wine. I'll provide the Holy Spirit to fill your life and give you life. And here's what I want you to understand. She stood there with six failed worship attempts, and now Jesus is standing there as the seventh option, the the, the perfect option, the complete option option as the bridegroom to say, I'm calling not just to you, but the entire nation of Samaria. I have come as Messiah to restore you to relationship with God, to make you my bride. When others have rejected you, I have, I have welcomed you in. He's revealing himself as Messiah to a people who are far away from him. Oh, they're spiritual. He he did it to the religious, morally upright person, but he does it to the spiritual person who sort of of honors God and and fears God, but doesn't commit to God. It's interesting. She then begins to talk about worship. (laughs) We've made this all about worship, and it is, but this worship only happens when she understands who's standing in front of her. She, She says, She says, oh, they've talked to us, back to John chapter 4. They've talked to us, um, they've said to us, the hour is coming. And Jesus says that the hour is coming. Remember, he talks about that hour. What's that hour? It's the hour of his death and his resurrection. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman replies, I I know the Messiah is coming. See, She's spiritual. I know the Messiah is coming, and and he will tell us um, all things. He was called the Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all the things we need to know. And Jesus said to her, listen, I who speak to you am he. You know, within Muslim traditions, one of the the misunderstandings um, that they would have is they say, well, Jesus was a prophet, but he he never declared himself to be Messiah. He just did. The Messiah you're talking about, I'm him. It, it, I, that's not to be combative. That's just to help you understand. Jesus actually said, I am the Messiah. To a woman, by the way, who was outside of God's chosen people at this point. 
I'm the one you're looking for. I'm, I'm the bridegroom who's standing here. Listen, he's calling you away from, from the compromise of being, fearing God but having your own gods on the side. He's calling you away from this duplicity of, well, I serve God, but I kind of have my own way of doing things. No, no, no. He's called you as the one to understand, I am the Messiah. I am the one who died for you. I'm the one who's paid for your sins. I'm the one who restores you. I'm calling you. Those who worship me will worship in spirit and truth. Why? Because I'm going to give the Holy Spirit to you, and you're going to be able to have connection and relationship with God who is the Spirit. Jesus elevates this woman. I love this story because he elevates her from being this outcast to suddenly becoming one of the greatest evangelists of her day. She now goes back to her community and says, come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. The thing I love about this is like Jesus didn't tell her everything she ever did. But that's the way she felt. She, like he was reading my mail. He was telling me things that nobody ever could tell me. He knew things about me that nobody ever knew. And friend, I'm going to tell you when Jesus begins to speak and his word begins to read your mail and he begins to speak over your life of the promise that he has for you, it's as though he knows everything about you. And she goes into town and she says, you got to come see this guy. He, knew, he knows all about us. And so they come, the Bible says that the entire community came and they heard, and many of them believed and followed Jesus. It's interesting that the morally upright struggle to follow, but yet those who are broken and realize they're broken, they easily, easily it seems, come to Christ. And then it brings to the the, the capstone moment of the sign that Jesus will now perform that proves he is Messiah the one who has supernatural power to heal. It's just one of his first recorded healing miracles of touching a sick boy with a chronic disease, a chronic illness that has plagued him for years and now is taking his life. It's the moment where Jesus intervenes in a boy's life. It's interesting. The first two conversations, the first miracle was to a Jewish people at a Jewish wedding. The second miracle was to a a Jewish Pharisee. The, The third conversation is to a Samaritan who's outside of the Jewish nation. And the fourth conversation is to what more is more likely a Hellenistic Jew, one who is sort of blended Hellenism into Judaism, and they are completely rejected by, 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 by Judaism in terms of their beliefs. So here's what I want you to say. It's, it's a picture of what we see in Scripture to the Jews first and then to the Gentile. Jesus is following a pattern. He's, he's, he's proclaiming himself Messiah to a Jewish wedding, now to a Jewish Pharisee. Now he goes outside to a Samaritan who's outside the covenant people and says, oh, well, by the way, the one you're looking for, I am he. And he's about to come to a father in a crisis moment and reveal himself as the one who speaks words of life that's not limited by distance or location and transform and heals a young son's body. And so we meet the father. Not the father, but the father of the story. And I simply just want to walk through his his story to help you today. He begins in verse 46, as I read to you. He hears of Jesus, and he goes to Jesus and makes a request. Come to my house. Come to Capernaum. It's a pretty bold request. To request a Jewish rabbi to come to a Hellenistic Jew or Gentile's home. They didn't do it. But he was desperate. You know what happens is, is when you're in crisis, there is such a thing as a crisis faith. Somebody this morning, you're in crisis. And all I want you to know today, if you're in crisis, if you're, if you're in desperate need, if you're in a, a difficult situation, that a lot of people have allowed crisis to take them away from God. But your crisis can actually serve you and actually bring you closer to Jesus. This man's crisis was the crisis that actually turned him from this, this influential leader of his day, candidly, into a beggar who would show up and beg Jesus, Jesus, would you please come to my house? Listen, it's up to you what you do with your crisis. You, you can let your crisis be the thing that, that, that causes you to doubt God. You can let your crisis be the thing that causes you to reject God. Well, if, God, if this happens to me, how could God be real? No, no, no. If this man had taken that approach, his son would have died. 
But the reality is he understood, I'm in a crisis and I don't have, I don't possess what it takes. I've tried for years, I'm sure, to, to, to intervene by way of medicine and doctors and incantations, but I hear there's a healer. I hear there's a man who claims to be the Messiah. I hear this man, Jesus, who seems to have this supernatural power to work signs and miracles, and I'm going to go to him because my crisis is not taking me away from God. My crisis will lead me to God. Your crisis can serve you you if you let it. It's exactly what happens. His crisis draws him closer and closer. I have the distinct advantage in my life. I've talked about it a little bit, but I I grew up uh, in, in, in in a family that has experienced supernatural miracles. That's why I believe it's easy for me to just talk about this stuff like, well, that's just how it is because I've seen it. Literally, I've seen it, I've heard it, I've, I've seen the results of the supernatural at work. My grandfather was a, a Pentecostal preacher who uh, really didn't, gra- didn't ever graduate high school, but ended up in Bible college. And, and <laughs> he's told me these stories, he's since passed and gone on to heaven, but, but he was in ministry until he was 88 years of age. At 88 years of age, he was uh, literally physically in Guatemala building churches, carrying cinder blocks at 88 years of age. And it was like he had the spirit of Caleb. Like he, like all the other, all the other people in the mission trip were like, who is this 90 year old man over here? Like just building, building, carrying these cinder blocks and trucking them all around. But I think that's the, that's the kind of person he was when it came to serving God. And, and there's a story that, that is within my family, within my culture, within my, my heritage of my grandfather as a young man, they went to Bible college. He would tell me we used to just on the weekends, you know, we didn't go out and party. We went out and we, we jumped in the back of somebody's truck and we would hitchhike down into Arkansas and we would just preach revivals in Arkansas. We had no money. We had no plan. We had no way to get back. We just went. And he goes, sometimes we go preach and revival would break out. We'd stay there for weeks. Now this is a married man with kids in Bible college. Some might call that irresponsible. He called it following the Lord. But, but I don't know if it's wisdom, but he did it. You hear what I'm saying? And, and they would just go. They, just, they would jump in a random stranger's truck, be like, where are you going? Well, we're hitchhiking down to Arkansas. We're gonna preach. And they would just go, they would just go on these, these missionary excursions, um, and, and they would just, they would, their sole purpose was just to win people to Jesus. Their sole purpose was to see signs and wonders and miracles break out. They, I told you this. I could never go to Walmart with my grandmother without it being a missionary trip to Walmart. I'm not kidding. Like, we didn't go to Walmart to buy bread. We went to Walmart to witness to the cashier. I mean, it was just like, come on, Grandma, let's go. She's like, do you know Jesus? I mean, like, seriously, had no reservation about telling people about Jesus and just praying for him right there. She wasn't, she was bold. She was kind. She was loving, but she didn't play around. She's like, I've been on this planet for one reason. That's to serve his glory. I've been on this planet for one reason, to bring the kingdom of God. That's why I'm here. That's what I grew up in. There's a particular incident of my grandfather, as he came out of Bible college, he was bivocational. He was a mechanic, he was a construction guy, just all that. And there's one particular instance, he was working on a car in a garage at work, and, and somehow there was a, a small fire that broke out, and it, it caught his sleeve on his, and on his arm on fire. And so he turned, and he went to put his arms in what he thought was a water, but it was actually gasoline. And my grandfather was engulfed in, in the flames on his arms. And, and thankfully, it kind of contained itself with his arms and some of his body. But they were able to, to beat the flames out. They were able to take him to the hospital. Now, you have to understand, in this day and age, um, people would die from burns of this degree, third degree burns on his arms because of just infection. The, the medical, this is in the, the 40s, the 50s, probably in, that, in the 50s. The, the medical advances are not what they are today. Many people died because of infection more than anything. And so he goes in the hospital. He's bandaged up, and, the, and they're telling him, like, you know, here's the thing. It, they, they, they stabilized him. They said, you know, you're going to live. Um, we just need to keep infection away from you. And so we just need to isolate you in this room. He's bandaged up. He's laying there. And, and here he is trying to serve God. It's a crisis moment. And they said to him, they said, now, uh, John Poole is his name. So John, um, here's what I need to tell you. If... If you get out of the hospital, <laughs> that's always a great thing to hear from your doctor. If you make it out of this place, um, number one, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never be able to use your hands again. They will be, because of the skin, they will be deformed. They will be in this kind of a retracted position. This is what you'll have to, to live with your life. This is what you're going to have. 
You, you will, they told him things like, you will never, the muscles will never recover, the, the arms will never fully recover, um, you'll have the evidence of burn marks, and you'll never, like, that means it'll never grow hair again, none of that will ever happen for you. And they said, so we're going to do our best, but just understand, your life is taking a direction, a change. But my, my grandfather was one who believed in miracles. And he said, I laid in that bed, and I prayed, and all of a sudden, one night, just a couple nights into me being in the hospital, the door opened. And in walked, he named the preacher and the, a, a friend, another one of his uh, a country preacher who believed in, in wonders and science. He says, I had a dream about you, and I felt like the Lord told me I need to come pray for you for healing. Lays his hands on my grandfather, prays for him, and he walks out of the room. Within two weeks, my grandfather walks out of the hospital, which is unheard of. Now, hold on. Without any visible remnant of what happened, hair grew on his arms. His arm, you, like if you saw his arms, his hands, I told you, he carried cinder blocks when he was 88 years of age. You would never know. Worked in built churches, built construction, worked on the farm, served people the rest of his life from the 50s all the way until just about, about maybe 10 years ago, went to be with the Lord. And, and, and never, you would have never known because everything was restored to its original state. Amen? Now here's the thing. Why do I tell you that story? Because number one, it's a true story. I know it's a true story. And here's the thing. Um, you can let your crisis take you away from God. It would have been easy for my grandfather to say, I've been serving you, God. I've been going out preaching revivals. I've been doing all this stuff. And now I'm laying here burnt in a bed. How's that fair? But no, no, no. He, he understood. My crisis, I'm going to lean into Jesus in this moment, not run away from him. Because he's the, he's the only one who can speak a word that can heal my body. Y'all hearing me today? He's the only one that can transform my life. He's the only one. He's the one who saved me. He's the one who created me. He's the one who could recreate me if need be. You see, your crisis, this crisis of faith, this man then turned into a confident faith. It went from crisis faith to confident faith. What do I mean? He heard from Jesus. Jesus said, go. And now there's a, there, there's a confidence that wells up inside of him that Jesus is sending his word. What, what I love about Jesus sending the word and not going to the house is simply this. It shows us that Jesus is not bound by distance. He's not bound by physical limitations. He can simply speak a word and it can transform people's lives. This is what I love about technology and campuses. See, there's a lot of people who think, well, I got to be in the room and I got to be. There. No, 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 no. All Jesus needs to do is speak a word. And no matter where you are, he his word can reach out and heal. His word can reach out and transform. He can save you right where you are. You don't have to be in the room for Jesus to work. I love this. He speaks a simple word. Go. Your son's going to live. And this man has a confident faith rise up inside of him. And he goes. And the word of God goes ahead of him. The Bible says at the very hour that he spoke it, the young boy became healed. And this man, while he is walking, wondering what happened, but having a confident faith, doesn't know for sure yet it's already happened. So there's far too many people who need to see it before they'll believe it. But this man believed it before he saw it. And because he, he believed it before he saw it, when he ran into his servants, it turned from a confident faith to a confirmed faith. Listen, I, I love confirmed faith. I love confident faith. Oh, but man, I love when God confirms the signs and wonders. I have no problem with telling somebody, go to the doctor and confirm it. Why? Because my confident faith can switch to a confirmed faith. Now, here's the thing with most people I've found. Most people give up between confident faith and confirmed faith. Most people stop and throw away their confidence. Most people who struggle, you're going to struggle between a comp. Well, I believe God's going to heal me. I got prayer. I, yeah, I, I heard the Lord. I feel like the word of God was spoken over me. Absolutely. I felt God's present. I felt like God said it's going to be okay. But I haven't seen it happen yet, so I don't have a confirmation. Many people abort the process in this moment. And I'm going to tell you, my, my encouragement to you is simply this. Do not throw away or give up your confidence while you're waiting. Do not give up your confidence. Listen, Hebrews chapter 10 says it this way. It says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. I'm, I'm talking to somebody today. You need to endure. 
You've got some need, the, the need. God is already working in the situation. While you're waiting for that, that confirmation of your confidence, you need endurance. He says, so that you may have done the will of God and may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will not delay. But my righteous ones, listen to this, will live by faith. Do you understand? We are called to live by faith, not by feelings, not by sight, by faith. Our confidence, we can look at situations, go, it doesn't look like it's all fixed, but my faith is in God who, who makes all things new again, who makes things right. He says, if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This, this is my, one of the top five verses of my all-time life verses. Here's what it is. But we are not of those who shrink back. Can I give you the the New International Wayland version, the NIWV, we don't back down. I, I don't care what, what I see. We don't back down. We don't give up. We don't quit. We, we just keep at it. We get up tomorrow. We make the same decision that we made today. We just, listen, if I trusted him today, why wouldn't I trust him tomorrow? Some of y'all need to, if I, if I trusted God today with my life, why wouldn't I get up tomorrow and trust him? No matter what comes my way, why wouldn't I get up tomorrow and trust him with my life? Why would I give up in the midst of the fight? Why would I give up? Why would I give up my confidence just because I haven't had confirmation yet? Why would I stop in the middle? Why would I, why would I pull up short? Listen, I love the scripture. It is literally one of the verses I quote all the time to myself. We're not the kind to back down. We don't back down. We don't give up. We are believers, which means we believe, which means we continue in faith, holding on, believing. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We don't give up. Don't give up. Well, you know, I guess this is just going to, how it's going to be. Listen, you can do that if you want to. I'm not giving up. No, no, no offense. You can do that if you want to. You, you can go, well, this is how life's going to be. This is how going to have Okay, great. You can do that if you want to. My Bible tells me that if I back down, then I'm backing down to destruction. I lose. But if I'm of the kind who do not back down, he says that he will give me the reward. Do not become weary, Galatians says, in well-doing. You will receive a reward in due season. In due t- I'm talking to some people who need a miracle today that you've gone from a confident faith and you may not have a confirmed faith, but I am telling you, do not, don't you dare give up in the middle. Don't you dare abort the process, the seed of God's word. Don't you dare give up when God is moving, even if you can't see it. Don't give up. Look at your neighbor. Say, don't give up. Look look at your other neighbor, the one you like more, less. (laughs) Tell him, don't give up. I'm sweating to death up here. Come on, tell him, don't give up. Nobody writes stories about people who give up. Nobody gives a testimony about, well, you know, they gave up. They gave it, a, they gave it a, a college try, and they gave up. I understand, I understand doubt. I understand questions. I understand reality. I understand all those things. I just, what I understand about it is every bit of it bows to the name of Jesus. That's what I understand. That the one who created me, that the God of the universe, that he makes promises, and I have this ability to trust in his promises or have this ability to reject his promises and allow the crisis to take me out instead of the crisis to, to, to draw me in. Don't give up. I feel like I need to come shake some people, just tell you, don't give up. Well, I guess they're always going to be addicted. Don't give up. I guess it's just always going to be addicted. I guess it's just how... And then we start just... Well, maybe they were just... They're just preconditioned this way. You're giving up. And they're just predisposed. To, we're all predisposed to sin. And I tell you, we all have the same problem. Every one of us have the same issue. It's sin. It's the sinful nature. It's the fallen nature. Well, I just, you know, I just, maybe I just, and we somehow have to come to grips and come to, and I'm not saying you have to be uh, aggressive and obnoxious, but I'm going to tell you, you could quietly just not give up. Just not giving up. Just not giving up. Well, pastor, what happens when people die? I just don't give up. And if that's, what the Lord, if that's what the Lord chooses to do, then I know this, that they're more healed than they've ever been. They're more alive than they've ever been. They're more at peace than they've ever been. They're, so, they're more alive than they've ever been. I'm just not giving up. I'm just not giving up. 
just not giving up. Just not let my feelings tell me how life is going to be. I'm going to follow his word. I'm going to follow this father who went. He could have, if he'd have given up, his son would have died. You see, it's clear in scripture, salvation, one of the main words used for salvation, the word sozo, it's the foundation of so many times. It literally means to be delivered from, to be freed from, to be saved. That means your salvation, absolutely. Absolutely. But it also means deliverance. It also means freedom. It also means healing. That he came to redeem every part of you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Yeah, but pastor, I've tried. I know. Just don't give up. I'm not saying you won't be weak. I can be weak and not give up. Man, there's times I've, 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 I've shouted at God. I've been angry. There's been times I've been weak. There's been times I've, I've shed the tears. God, can we be done with this already? But I'm not giving up. Because he tells me, We're not the kind who shrink back. We're not the kind who back down. We don't give up. You know, I used to love, Tommy Barnett used to say it this way about pastoring. He said, you get done preaching on Sunday. He said, every pastor wants to quit on Monday. It's a true story. Every pastor goes home and wants to quit on Monday. Like, I just need to quit. Tommy Barnett used to say, "You, you could quit. Just know you can't do it. You can tell people you quit, you just can't do it. And I love that for now he's 80 some years of age and still that spirit of Caleb on him and just has has built incredible churches and dream center and just God has used him in such profound ways. I'll tell you what, what it is. Sometimes the difference is just people that don't give up. It's not that they're smarter. It's not that they're more spiritual. (laughs) It's not that they're God's favorite because you're all God's favorite. It's that they don't give up. I'm talking to some people today. I'm talking to some people, just don't give up. You prayed so many prayers, you thought, God, surely, maybe this is just what you want. No, it's, if it doesn't line up with his word, it's not what he wants. Listen, he says, I will cause all things to work together for good to those who love me and are called by my name. So this tells me this, if it's not good, God's not done. So I'm not giving up till it's good. I'm not giving up until God's done. I'm not giving up. The outcome of this miracle led from a confirmed faith to a contagious faith. Can I tell you something? Um, There are some people on the other side of your not giving up who are going to benefit that you don't even know. Hmm. You don't even met them yet. But you're going to have a story. You're going to have a testimony. It's what we used to call it. You're going to have a story about the goodness of God and the undeniable miracle that he wrought in your life. It becomes a contagious faith. The Bible says that this man's entire household believed. He he came home and said, I talked to Jesus. Jesus said, go. Our son was healed. The entire household now followed Jesus. You know what's interesting about these stories? Every one of these people responded and followed Jesus. Nicodemus ultimately became a follower of Jesus. The Samaritan became an evangelist for Jesus. the the father of his home on Father's Day became the spiritual leader, not of a a Hellenistic outside of God's promised family, but a family that was following Jesus. He became the spiritual leader of his home. He became the one who gave testimony to the power of Jesus. His faith became contagious. And so the question is that as I close is this, where are you in the story? Are you the morally upright person who's yet to make the decision to be saved, to be born again. You're trusting in your works and the things you do to get you there. But Jesus says this, I I appreciate um, your, your goodness, as you call it, but the reality is, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Goodness is not all that good when you understand how God sees it. Are you the, the spiritual person, the Samaritan at the well? The, are you the person who has a kind of a spiritual sort of uh, uh, awareness about you, but yet you find yourself in broken situation after broken situation, and the pain is very real, and Jesus stands before you this morning and says, I am he. I'm what you're looking for. I'm the bridegroom that you're looking for. I'm the husband that you wish you had. I, I'm, the, I'm the Messiah, the one you're talking about. I'm him. I've come to save you. Not just you, 
It's your entire nation. I'm inviting you into relationship. The kind of relationship you've been longing for. An intimacy with God. A friendship with God. A knowing that there's peace in my soul. That there's relationship. I am right with God. That I can walk out of here today and know that he's promised me abundant life for now and eternal life forever. Or are you that that person in crisis? You're in a challenging spot. Maybe maybe you are a believer. The crisis is trying to draw you away, and you're going to have to make a decision in the crisis. It's it's interesting. I talked to a a young man in our church this morning. said, I woke up last night. I was in crisis. I'm like, we all go through this, but your crisis can serve you. It can be the thing. It can be the thing that, that, that draws you to Jesus instead of pushing you away if you let it. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Father, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would speak. Whatever is of me, let it fall to the ground. Whatever is of you, I pray that it would fall on good soil today. that you would break through the blinders that the enemy has placed upon us. I feel like there's even some in this room that you've been resistant, not just apathetic, but resistant towards God. And he still loves you. I pray today that every wall would come down, that every doubt would be answered. I pray that today, God, the morally upright person would see their own wickedness and realize they need a Savior, and that Savior is you. That we would move beyond just being spiritual into being in relationship with the living God. This morning you are here. I'm going to ask nobody moving around unless it's just an emergency. We understand that, but... You're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor? Holy Spirit's dealing with me today and drawing me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Maybe you're the morally upright. Maybe you're the the spiritual approach. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. Jesus approached them all the same. I am the one you're looking for. I am here. Simply, I'm going to ask you this. You say, that's me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to receive Jesus. I want to become that new creation. If that's you today, you'd say, I want, to, I want to surrender to him. Or maybe it's a recommitment. You need to come back to God. Would you just lift your hand and say, pray for me? That's awesome. Come on, that's it. Just lift it up high. Don't, don't, don't you dare be ashamed or intimidated in this moment. This is what this whole church is about. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. The hands all over this place. Oh, man. People responding to Jesus. It's the most important thing that can happen. Now there's hands all over this place. I appreciate you lifting those. You, you can put those down. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar because we want to pray with you. But before I do that, because I'm going to simultaneously invite some other folks, because there's another group of people I feel like I need to talk to. You're in crisis. Maybe it's a crisis of faith. Maybe it's a crisis that has led to a crisis of faith. Regardless of what the crisis is, you have a choice today to lean in or lean out. And just as a response of faith, you say, Pastor, I'm in the middle of a crisis, and I've been tempted to lean out, but I'm leaning in. If that's you, just lift your hand. I'm in crisis, but I'm leaning in. I'm in crisis. I'm going to lean in. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. Come on. Lord sees that. Come on. I'm not giving up. Come on, every campus, I'm not giving up. I'm not backing down. I'm not, I'm not quitting in the middle. I'm not quitting in the middle. My confidence will turn into confirmation if I don't give up. I'll receive the harvest, the reward, if I don't give up. Yeah, so good, so good. You, you can put your hands down. Can, can we all stand together? And again, I ask no one to leave. I'll dismiss you in just a second. But if you raise your hand uh, to, to receive Christ today, you want to get saved, you want to be born again, Would you do me a favor? Would you just step out of your seat, make your way out, come to this altar. We'd love to pray with you. 
and help you get started in your relationship. Come on, just don't even hesitate.